So, I'm wanting you to think back in your life today. I want you to think back of all your times involving the church. And some, some of you are like, oh boy, here we go, right? And, and some of you are like, oh no, I, I've, I've, church has been a good thing. Some of you guys are like, eh, church has been a place of frustration, of boredom, of anger or hurt. People hurt me in the church. Some, sometimes, some of you guys might have stories you could tell about how you went to a certain church and they treated you terribly, or you went to another church or they, or they were just like, they never even spoke to me. They didn't care if I was there or not. Or maybe you talk about how, yeah, you went to this crazy place at a winery, you know, in a weird little building, and it was too hot or too cold, and there was no parking, and all these things, right? You could tell these stories. And, and you'd be, you know, that's true. That's what happens. We can all tell those stories. Um, but I want you to think through that. You know, think about, like, there's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And all of the, everything in between. And um, you could talk about casseroles and music and, and culture and language. And all of that is a part of this. And so for someone who is outside of the church, and we're all like, hey, you come to church with us. And they're just like, no. You know, and we're like, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? And they're like, well, I can give you about a million reasons. For, first of all, I have no idea what you, why you even do this. Think of how weird it is, right? Think of how weird church is. First of all, where other place do you, where, what other thing do you do in your life where you come and everybody just kind of sits in a common area and another person gets up and yaps? far too long as it is, and then we sing songs, and every once in a while we even eat dinner together, but it's like only a little cracker and a little cup. It's like, you know, what, what sort of voodoo is this, right? And I mean, that's the kind of thing that if you start to think about it, church is weird. Now, we just got done saying that the biblical word for weird is holy, right? Which is kind of interesting when you think about it. it church is set apart. And what we talked about as we've gone through the book of Hebrews is this, this powerful overlap if you'll allow that language, is overlap between heaven and earth. We actually believe, I actually believe, everybody's like, don't say we, it's only you, Mark. But I actually believe that when we're in this place, that heaven and earth overlap. That when we start saying things like in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that like there are angels that get fired up and start shredding on their electric guitars. People are like, angels don't have that, they have harps. I think they're electric guitars. It's my personal opinion, the Bible doesn't say. It does say every instrument under heaven, so there you go. And so... Psalm 150, by the way. And so, and so all these possibilities exist. And so we, but I believe that when we gather in this place, it's what we just sang about. It's this idea that the, that the church triumphant, the saints that have gone before us, are here with us. And I believe that with all of my heart because that's what the Bible teaches you and me. We just got done starting Hebrews chapter 12 last week. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And this is what church is all about. And so we were talking about, you know, praise and worship's kicking this idea around. Could we, could we maybe build a building, right? Because we're, we have all those problems we mentioned about not, not enough parking and all these things. And besides the wineries growing, and it's like we just we got to do something. And so we've been looking at it. We're trying to figure it out and all these things. And, and it just causes me to go to bed scary, scared every night because I'm like, how do you do that? I don't know how to do that. And the Lord will take care of it. But one of the things we said is it's not going to be building a church. Guys, I'm looking at the church right now. And Jesus has been building it all along, right? And some of you guys are from me and out of town, and you're part of the Big C Church, not just this congregation, but the, the church of Jesus Christ Almighty who lives and reigns, right? And, and, and so that's what this is. And so when we talk about what cannot be shaken, we're talking about church. We're talking about, about the assembly of God's people. God builds the church, and people build buildings, and with his help, we might build one too that won't be perfect and it won't be the right size and the parking may not even be very good there. I don't know. But the point of it all is, is the good news of Jesus Christ will keep on pumping, right? And, and, if, and if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I hope that doesn't happen, but it's the Lord's will. If I get hit by a bus tomorrow, some other guy will yap and tell you about the good news of Jesus, right? And that's what, how it goes. It's how it's been going for 2,000 years. It's how it's going to go until the day that the sky rips open. Yeah, we believe that too, that the sky's going to rip open and that Jesus himself is going to descend and he's going to the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are still alive will be caught up to meet him in the middle of the air. I mean, you're like, weird stuff, you Christians. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let's get to work. Let's do this, sir. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. I want you guys to see this. And I made this comment yesterday to some folks, and I said, you know, every Christian needs to grapple with this text, this, these words, because, because this helps us have this, the lens by which we read the whole Bible. It really does. There are two mountains. There are two mountains. 
And you're like, Mark, are you saying there are two mountains? No, the Bible says there are two mountains. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched. And I want to pause right there because what the, what the author is referring to there is by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's hearkening us to look, re- remember what we read back in Exodus. Now, everybody's like, I didn't read Exodus and I ain't reading Exodus. But if you had read Exodus, you would see there's this story where God, maybe you watched the Charlton Heston movie, maybe the Ten Commandments. You've seen this story, right? It's this idea where God comes in this giant cloud and there's fire and brimstone, right? And all the stereotypes that you can imagine are present. And so all of those happen, and then, and then the people go to the mountain and they are, they're scared. And Charlton Heston was really scared. I mean, Moses was really scared. And you see how it's going, right? And so they, they couldn't, one of the rules, if you read Exodus 19 and 20, and even a little following, is that, you couldn't even touch the mountain because it was holy. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that we then talk about this gathering as being holy? Isn't it interesting that the book of Hebrews says that you have been made holy because of Jesus forever? Hebrews 10, verse 10. Chapter 10, verse 10. And so all of these things are coming together right at this moment. And he says, yeah, that whole business about that mountain, that's not where you're at. That's not where you're at. That was then, this is now. And look what he says. What is that mountain? It's burning with fire. There's the fire and brimstone. Darkness, that's what a lot of people think of when they think of you know, church stuff. Because I grew up in our church, it was very dark. Right? I always tell that story. And then gloom, that was also something I experienced in the church growing up. It's like if the community I grew up in is if you expressed emotion, you can imagine how this worked out for me, but if you express emotion, that was like you were a Pentecostal. Right? And I'm like, well, Pentecostals actually have different theology. It's not just emotion. But that's another story. And so, and so, and so gloom and storm. Right? And I'm going to guess that I'm not the only one that, ex- that held, had more of this in their life growing up than the other mountain that we're going to talk about. And this is the problem that all Christians struggle with. And guys, myself included. We all do. You and me both, we struggle with this. Because we tend to get confused about what God is saying to us. Because on one hand, God says, and he said it right here today, be holy. But on the other hand, he says, I made you holy. And you're like, well, which is it? And he's like, yes. But the answer is, it's so important to see that he makes us holy first and then invites us to join him in what all of that entails as our lives unfold on this earth. Take a look at the next part of that passage and I forgive all these nonsense about B's and A's, but the way they versed out these, the this, this sentence is weird, so you just got to kind of take pieces of it. He says that those who heard God's voice begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Do you know what I encounter as I go out into the world and I'm hanging out with people and they say, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a pastor. I always make the joke. I always think I should say like motivational speaker or something so they don't get too scared. But when I do say pastor, a lot of times the conversation ends there. And you know why? It's because of this. They think, and I'm talking about pure card-carrying atheists who suddenly fear God for a minute. Because, you know, even if you're an atheist, which is by definition the belief that there is no God, um, and I know certain atheists might have some nuances on that, but the point being is, is if you do believe that there is no God, then you sort of have to have some sort of thing to base that on. And they would, they would tell you what those things are. But someone who is a theist who believes in God, but maybe doesn't know who he is, you know, maybe doesn't know if is Jesus God. You know, some people will say, oh, all the religions point to the same God. Well, the problem that you run into that is we say God is Jesus. God's name, the name above all names, the name by which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess is Jesus Christ our Lord. Most of the, of the religions of the rest of the world would be very offended <laughs> by that comment, right? They're like, no, 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 no. You know, ask a Jew, is Jesus Lord? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they would say, don't even say the name Lord. You, know, they don't do that. you, know, you ask a Muslim, and they're certainly going to be mad about that. Okay? The issue is this. They don't want God to speak to them because they think when He speaks, they will not be able to bear what is commanded. Most people you and I run into that don't go to church, this is the issue. And you know, they might say, hey, it's because the church hurt me. It's because the church let me down. And, and I would probably go, yep, me too. What did you choose to do about it? Well, I went into ministry. You know, what are you gonna, wait, I mean, I don't know what to say about that. 
Okay? But the idea is, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Those who heard God's voice said, shush it. Because if you continue to talk, we will die. We cannot bear what's commanded. And see, here's the deal. There's a lot of people out there that say, here's what it means to follow Jesus. Be good, try harder, get better. And you know what we can't do? We cannot bear that. Because what we do is we look at our lives and we see evidence that we're not getting better. We see evidence that no matter how hard we try, we fail. And we see evidence that the more we try to do or the more we try to do whatever, I mean, it just doesn't work. And so then we're like, so then does that mean God doesn't love me? Take a look at the next verse. verse 12, chapter 12, verse 22, the first half of that verse. You have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. Okay? This is the difference between the two mountains. The one mountain is gloom and darkness and fear. This mountain is about heaven. It's about city, a city about a God that lives. The other, that other mountain is not. Okay? And yet we've got both of these mountains. They're like, wait, what? Well, I don't understand. Keep going. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Now I want to pause there because I'm, my case that I'm trying to make to you is that they're here right now. That we're with them. And everybody's like, Mark, you know. But remember what we did. Two weeks ago we did faith, right? By faith. And, you know, the Scripture says, Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 is, faith is the evidence of things that we cannot see, right? It's the certainty of things that we you know, that, that, are, that we don't have in front of us, right? And so, and so when we talk about that, we shorten that into a simple discussion. Faith is life on God's terms. We take His word for it. We do. And so when His word says this, and it says this is where you've come, and, and again, my sinful broken self is going to be like, nah, now you're like doing Star Trek or something. That's, that's not real. That's like Harry Potter. I mean, that's not real. The Bible says it is. And if I say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my life, I need you in my life, then all of a sudden, these kinds of things are kind of come into my world, and this is life on God's terms. This is this overlap between heaven and earth. Heaven is not a place we die and go to. Heaven is a place that Jesus died and brought it to us. Do you see the difference there? Heaven is not a place you die and go to. Heaven is a place that Jesus died and brought it to us. Before Jesus, you guys, we couldn't assemble in this place if God was actually here. We would all die. We would go to that mountain and there would be fire and brimstone and gloom and darkness and we would die. Even Moses nearly died. And, and you know, it was just like and God had like done some sort of special thing to keep him from dying. And yet, but see, here's the thing. Because of Jesus, he has brought heaven to earth. You know, in the olden days, they would always... You know, they would always have all these strange things that were in a worship service. They'd have, like, and I, I experienced this when I went to seminary. My first experience at seminary chapel was I went in there, and they had this dude swinging an incense thing, you know. And I'm like, what in the world is that? Because I don't come from a place where they do that, right? And so, I mean, I mean, I knew what it was, a dude swinging incense. But why would you do it, right? And, and I was, does, that mean, does that mean I'm not Lutheran? Because I never saw that before. I mean, what does that mean? You know, I was having all these... You know, and it's like, well, everyone's like, no, you're not Lutheran for all the other kinds of reasons. But actually, you know, I just kind of think this whole centrality of Jesus is pretty cool. So I remain that in that crew. And so I think that's my crew. That's my posse. And so what we do is we try to understand why would they do that. And it's because they read things like Revelation where it talks about incense being the prayers of the saints, ascending before God, a fragrance to God's nose, which is weird. Holy, right? And so don't worry, we're not breaking out any incense here. But the idea here is, why would they do that? There's a reason. There's a story. There's a purpose. We have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. The church, the assembly of the firstborn. Which firstborn? Firstborn from among the dead. He referred to him a chapter or two ago. The firstborn from among the dead and to whose names are written in heaven. Now, earlier I asked you, Think about your life in church, right? And that had the good, the bad, and the ugly all in there. Now I want, you to add, I want you to think of another thing. I want you to think of your name actually written in heaven. I want you to th- I want, in fact, if we weren't, you know, like in a weird church setting, I'd actually have you pull out pen and paper and write it down and just see what it looks like. Because that's what it looks like from God's point of view when he looks at you. Your name is written in heaven. 
This is his promise. And when it hits your ears, I invite you to believe it. Not because of anything that you've done, but because of everything that he has done. He has given you and me everything so that your name and my name could be written there. It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what it's called in Revelation chapter 20. And it's this idea that whoever's name is written in the book of life will live with him forever. That's, what's, that's, what, that's a promise. And so when we see that the church of the firstborn is Mount Zion, that that's the place where names are written in heaven, it's like, you know, before Jesus came, you actually had to go to the land of Israel, to Jerusalem, to the temple. That was the only place. And now, Jesus said this thing like, I want you to go and make disciples in how many nations? In all of them, right? And especially those ones that where they don't look like you or talk like you. That's for, I, that was really, I mean, if you follow the story, that's where it goes. And you, to, you know, in Acts, he follows that statement up with, you know, in Jerusalem, that's where you know. That was, that was, those guys knew Jerusalem. That's where they lived. Judea, that was kind of like, you know, Missouri. Um, or, or we could include Oklahoma in that, right? And, and, and then you could go out a little farther, and then that's Samaria. That's the place that nobody wanted to go. That's the place where all those Samaritans live, right? In their language, that was, an, a, that was a racial slur. And then to the ends of the world. This is what it's all about. And so when we talk about the church of the firstborn, that's who you and I are, the firstborn from among the dead. We believe in a guy. We had a great time at the Lutheran Student Center Tuesday night. We were talking about, um, you know, they were asking about, you know, these different things. And somebody asked about dinosaurs. It was a great question. And one of the pastors sitting next to me goes, you know, there's a lot I don't know about dinosaurs, but here's what I do know. We believe in a dude that walked out of a tomb alive. And he goes, I kind of just set my whole life based on that. And yeah, I admit, a scientist might look at me and go, well, that's weird. And, and, and I would take that as a compliment because that's holy. right? That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. And yeah, we can go study dinosaurs. We can go study science. And that's awesome. That is a gift from God. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. But the stories that get told around all those things, that's where we got to focus. What story are we telling? Take a look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. And you're like, wait, Mark, we only read from Hebrews. Where are you going to Genesis? Well, we've got to bring something in because he started talking about Abel, right? Who's this Abel fellow? Well, Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, it says, The Lord said to Cain, oh, now you might remember Cain and Abel, right? And what happened was is Cain, had, Cain and Abel both came out and they offered a sacrifice or an offering to God, okay? And Cain's offering apparently wasn't the same as Abel's. And it says that God looked at Abel's offering, but he didn't look at Cain's. Now, the English translation will say with favor, because they're trying to kind of help us understand what that means. But the point is, is that for some reason, God didn't seem to be moved by Cain's offering. And what did Cain do? He got mad. He got jealous. He didn't trust things on God's terms. He took things into his own hands, put them onto his terms, and he murdered his brother. Cold blood. Murdered Abel. He went out into the field. He waited for him. And he jumped him. And he murdered him. And then, when the Lord shows up, he said, you know, the Lord kind of like, what have you done? As if he didn't know. But then he says this. Well, he says, what have you done? Listen. Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. Did you catch that? Abel's blood cries out to me from the ground. And so what he's saying there is that that blood is... Is, is accusing, is convicting Cain for this crime. Is demanding justice. That's what, that's what that blood is doing. It is demanding righteousness. It is demanding, um, gr it is demanding the whole thing where we talk about punishment or rest retribution. That's the word I could not spit out. Retribution. Right? It's, de it's demanding something needs to be done. And if you and I, if you and I had a loved one murdered today, we would make that same cry. We'd make that same demand. Where is justice? And we would not be wrong to do that. Guys, that's Mount Sinai. That's that mountain of darkness and gloom. Justice must be done. Justice must be done. And God does not ignore that. He does not. When there is injustice, He hates that. He has done all kinds of things. We know from Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament that the wrath of God will yet be poured out. It's coming. And so we're like, but, but, wait a minute. Because Abel's blood still cries out. Now, 
Take a look at the next passage, Hebrews 12, verse 24. You have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So now we, have, we still have brothers killing brothers, but this time it's Adam who kills Mashiach, the, the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus. We have human who kills God. That's what we got. That's what we got. And what does God's blood, what does Jesus' blood cry out from the ground about you and me? <laughs> what does his blood cry out? Grace. Mercy, forgiveness. His blood cries out love. Do you see how that works? So, so every time the devil, yes, oh yeah, that's this other crazy thing that we believe in because the Bible keeps telling us about him, this evil creature called Satan in the Old, in the old Testament. You know, that was the Old Testament Hebrew, which means the accuser. And that word gets carried in the New Testament. Jesus also calls him the deceiver. And, and he says that when he speaks, he, he speaks his native language, which is lies. Right? He comes before God in front of you and in front of me, and he says, look at what they have done. Right? Or what they didn't do when they should have. Right? That's what he does. He's accusing you and me of all of those things. And Jesus' blood cries out, and it speaks a better word. It speaks a better word. It speaks mercy and grace and forgiveness and love for you and for me. His blood purchased. That's the word redeems. He redeems. He purchased you and me away from the accuser, away from the deceiver, and sets us free. I mean, that's just what He did. He set us free. And so this whole idea, it's like, well then... Well then, why do we still have the two mountains? Because here's, what, here's the problem. A lot of people think, oh, in the Old Testament, God was grouchy. In the New Testament, he like became a teddy bear or something. I mean, that's, that's we've been talking about that. That's just wrong. Do you know who talks more about the fires of hell than any character in the Bible? Jesus. I mean, it's not even close. He talks more about it than anybody. Because he's here to say, I'm here to save you from that. I'm here to rescue you from that. Sometime you want to just sit down and read John chapter 3 when Jesus talks to Nicodemus. Just read that. It's in your Dig Deeper. So see, you could. You could. It's right there. You just right there. Dig Deeper, John 3. And you read that story, and Nicodemus shows up. He's one of the religious guys. He's the, he's the Pharisee. He's the teacher. He's supposed to know everything. And Jesus is like, you mean you're a teacher of these things, and you don't even understand what I'm saying to you? Now. Yeah. And what happens in that conversation is Jesus says, for God so loved the, what did he say? The world, right? That includes the Samaritans, right? Remember who the Samaritans are? That's the people you and I don't like. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish, will not die, but will have life everlasting. This is the promise of God for you and for me. And then in verse 17, this is the part we don't often remember. He says that, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, which is all, always the reason why church should not be a place of condemn, a place of condemnation. It's a place of gospel nation, right? It's the place of telling the good news, talking about what God has done for you and for me, not saying, oh, you're all a bunch of sinners. You need to go down to that Lutheran church or that AG church or that... Pentecostal church, or whatever, whoever you were in the mood to, to, to put down that week. Okay? Instead, what we do is like, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about a God who gave everything for you. John 3.17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. But verse 18 remains. Verse 18 remains. And that is, for those, but, those who, but those who reject the Son stand condemned already. See, if you take God and who's coming at, it, at you on His terms, which is saying, I will save you, I'll do everything for you, I will, you don't have to do anything, I will save you. And you're like, nah, no thanks, get out of here, right? If it's one of those deals, then, then you're still at the first mountain. You're still at the gloom and the darkness and the fire and the brimstone. And that's all you got. If you want life on your terms then it's you and that mountain, Mount Sinai. Mount, the mountain where it says you better be good, you better try harder, and you better get better. And I'm talking all the way to perfect. Matthew 
or you're going to die forever. That's the other thing in Revelation chapter 20 is the second death. We will all experience, unless Jesus comes back before then, we will all experience the first death. We will. And it sucks. And I'm going to use that word very intentionally. It's bad. It is terrible. It is the worst thing in the world. It is the last enemy to be defeated. 1 Corinthians 15. That is the first death. We will experience that. But God loves us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Can you guys read those green words with me? Cannot be shaken. Let us be thankful. How do we come into a place when we've experienced death and still praise God? How do we do that? Because we believe His promises. Because we believe this isn't the end. We believe it's the first death, not the second death. The first death has no power over those whose names are written in heaven. We believe in Jesus who rose from the grave and who will come back and take you and me out of the grave. That's what we believe. And it cannot be shaken, so we're thankful and we worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Not the fear, not the kind of fear where you have to run in the hole and hope God doesn't smite you tomorrow. But the kind of fear where we're like, dude, you are awesome. You are amazing. I bow my head before you. I go to my knees because of you. I put myself on the floor because of you. Because you give me everything that I, I could ever hope for and ever need. He is a consuming fire. A purifying fire. In fact, the Greek word there for fire is pure. That's where we get our word for purify. That's exactly what he's doing for you and for me. And he says, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's go do some stuff together. Let's take what I've given to you and share it with everyone else. Sometimes that just means you hold the door open for somebody. Sometimes that means somebody calls you in the middle of the night and says, my, my heart is burning, I need to talk. And so you listen, even though you've got that 6 a.m. appointment you've got to somehow make. Sometimes it means that when your spouse screams at you and you, have, you feel your fists fist clench up, that you just sort of let it go. And the words, yes, dear, become wonderful again, right? This is what we do. We follow Jesus. We seek His face. And we put our lives into His hands by faith, living on His terms, trusting that those terms cannot be shaken. Can we pray about that? Please pray with me. Father, we love You and we thank You and we ask You for Your help. Help us trust in You when we don't seem to be able to trust in You. Help us trust in You, fix our eyes upon You, to see You as the author and the perfecter of our faith and not as someone to be afraid of, not as someone to hide from, let us hear the words that Your blood, Jesus, speaks on our behalf. Grace and mercy, forgiveness and love. Lord, we pray boldly for You to help us do that. When we leave this place today, go with us. Accompany us. And as we get into our busy hustle and bustle, keep reminding us, nudging us. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, love. And let us live our life by those terms. Those are Your terms. In the mighty name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.